Hello everyone. Welcome to our GP Bullhound German Digital Services Market Update webinar. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Julian Riedelbauer. I'm partner and head of the German office. In today's webinar, we will present our latest thoughts and research on the digital services sector and we will host a panel discussion with great panelists. I will begin with a presentation on the German market and then hand over to my colleague Simon Nichols and Ravi Geda. Let's start with a quick view on the German market. We have advised a number of transactions in the digital service sector, a lot together with Simon Nichols um, he is heading our international um, digital services practice and is the one working alongside me, finding the right buyers, negotiating the buyer, uh, the mandates, um, negotiating the best deals with for our clients. Um, we have a one firm approach, so we work together as one global team. For example, we sold Minecraft software um, engineering and advisory and consulting company to Genui and Prime Pulse, two private equity investors, um, one is family backed. Um, Prime Pulse is the family office of the founder of Klaus Weimann. Namex to Merkle, big agency based in Switzerland and Germany, um, well known Elbkind to Reply Group, TLGG to Omnicom. Thanks, Christoph, for following our advice and hiring us back then. Then Conrad Kane to WPP and their unit possible and CLISPA to Market Tech Holdings. And this will list will continue. It's a very, very important sector for us. If we look at the German sector and um, German hit list of transactions, which is on the next slide, um, you will see that very few digital agencies in the top 20 remain founder led. And you will also see um, that it's quite crowded at the top. So lots of amazing agencies fighting for clients. Um, the market um, is big, but also competitive. And Reply, for example, they acquired a lot of uh, different companies in Germany. Um, they are public listed in Italy. Then Pia, um, thank you very much. Christian for joining us. Lots of acquisitions backed by the private equity investor Acquistone, very relevant player. Then Planet, owned by Service Plan Group, founder owned. Team Neustar, um, founder owned, but they have a publishing group as an investor. Then Diva E, backed by the private equity investor Amaram. Valtech, part of the international Valtech organization. 3C, belonging to Berda, um, MGM belonging to Algaia, Init, recently acquired by Amaram, private equity, and Fisher Appelt, founder owned. So you see, it's just three founder owned um, agencies in the top 10. And if you look at the number 11 to 20, um, the next slide, um, then you can see that again here, it's very, very much private equity and corporate um, focused. So you have um, just um, one pilot that is founder owned. And even EWAC has recently been sold to North Holding, a private equity investor, or um, also um, the others like um, TWT, TVT, and they used to be founder owned. They've been sold to Griven Group a few years ago, a publishing group. Um, so it is really private equity and um, corporate big groups driven. Now, this also shows that the consolidation will continue and you will see um, for the remaining or the smaller agencies, good opportunities to sell to private equity backed groups, to strategic buyers and um, otherwise, you stay independent, but then, of course, it's difficult to make it into the league tables. 
So I think it's an, it's an amazing um, situation. It changed a lot in the last three to four years, and I'm sure the consultation will go on. And with that, I will hand over um, to Simon Nichols, as said, head of our digital services practice, partner colleague from London, and Ravi Geda, director, also working in the sector a lot, um, also from London. Over to you, Simon. Great, thank you, Julian. Uh, and uh, in addition to what we've been up to in Germany, just to give you quick um, context for our global activity, uh, I mean, we have genuinely a market leading experience set in this arena. Um, we've completed three of the top five largest deals in Europe for digital agencies, Jellyfish, Oliver, Essence. Uh, Jellyfish uh, last year was the biggest deal in Europe for five years, which was $650 million. Uh, and we transacted over a billion dollars in, in transaction value in 2019 alone. Uh, and if we flip on one slide, put it in broader international context, uh, we've been super active in both the US and Europe, um, mirroring, I think, activity across the globe. We've had a run rate of about a deal a month for the last five years, some around the world in this sector. Um, and uh, we see a very active book of um, transactions for us and indeed in the sector more broadly as we move forward as well. One of the things we're going to talk about on the panel is the uh, uh, significant amount of consolidation that continues driven by innovation, creativity and technology. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going to come back in five minutes to, uh, to introduce our panel, but quickly we're going to cover some of the key trends we see in M&A um, and driving that M&A uh, across the world. I'm going to pass to my colleague Ravi Gedia. Hi, afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Simon. Let's start with a, a few digital services M&A data points. The first chart here looks at digital services M&A activity globally since Q3 2019. Unsurprisingly, we have seen volumes decline through 2020, with total deal value starting to come back in Q3 this year. But what we can definitely say is there is still an active market for quality assets. If we then think geographically, the US remains the most active region, but Europe is not far behind. If we look at Europe by country, we've seen fewer deals in Germany than UK and France year to date, but from our real world experience, Germany remains a highly attractive opportunity for consolidators that are looking to access the region. If we then look at this from the view of consolidator types, then so far consultancies have been the most active group year to date, although marketing agencies are not far behind. Breaking that down to individual consolidators. Next slide. Thank you. Accenture has so far been the most active consolidator in the market, as it was last year. In our reports, we highlight a dozen or so key trends driving M&A in the sector. Today, we have selected four to talk through with you, starting with how an explosion of growth in the digital platforms is changing the game. These are the fastest growing audiences in the world for brands and their growth has only been accelerated by COVID. Twitch, for example, has grown more than three times in the past three and a half years. Instagram has quadrupled in the past five years. These are huge audiences and brands see them as key routes to market and they require real expertise to address. Moving on, Gartner has quoted that Content, not data, will be the bottleneck. This refers to the fact that there is a lack of scalable content creation processes available in the market, particularly towards the last few years of the previous decade. We saw a dramatic increase in the volume of marketing and content assets required, driven by channel fragmentation and the requirement for content to be personalized. The challenge for marketeers is that budgets have stayed largely the same, and this is creating a really interesting dynamic for agencies. For our third trend, this is around programmatic. Programmatic media has been around for quite a few years, 
but the long promise of second wave media, traditional media, becoming programmatic is happening now. TVs and signage are becoming internet connected. We are excited by this because there are, these are major advertising formats. And this shift to programmatic has a long way ahead of it. The battle to take advantage of these formats is only just beginning. Finally, from our vantage point, having sold over 200 agencies, we can see that the agency model is continuing to evolve. Before 2010, agencies were all services. They didn't really have any tech. Between 2010 and 2020, we saw the emergence of tech-enabled agencies with largely internal technology tools to perform better and more efficiently. From circa 2020, we think that we are going to see the emergence of tech-led hybrid agency model with both software and services addressing the same disciplines with the client, each supporting the other. Those are our trends for today. I'll hand back to Simon for the panel discussion. Great, thank you, Ravi. Uh, and uh, it's uh, perhaps I might welcome my panel onto the virtual stage because um, it's uh, my great pleasure now to moderate a panel discussion with some of the genuinely the foremost digital services leaders in Germany. Uh, I have here with me today, uh, Christian Tiedemann, the CEO of PIA. Uh, Christian's run not one, uh, uh, but a whole bunch of the leading agencies in Germany uh, over the last decade or so. He took shops and friends to an IPO by reverse takeover, led an MBO of Cognetus, and then was CEO of Comarco Group uh, before selling that to WPP. And today he runs the largest independent digital agency in Germany. Uh, Ulrike Handel, CEO of Dentsu in Germany and the whole Dark region. Uh, so Ulrike runs one of the largest networks in the whole of Germany, responsible, I, I think I read, for something like 3,000 people, uh, but also previously ran the independent digital advertising group Ad Pepper Media. Uh, and finally, Christoph Bornschein, the founder and CEO of digital transformation agency TLGG. I had the pleasure of advising Christoph and his co-founders on their cell to Omnicom some years ago. Uh, Christoph is now making waves, expanding TLDG internationally, including into the US, and advising global brands on digital change and connected communication. So I guess all three of my um, panel today have experienced both of large agency networks and independent digital players. Um, so I thought I might start there on the, uh, uh, as a topic of discussion. One of the things that we've seen very clearly as, a, uh, as an advisory group is that there's a lot of disruption to the existing world order for marketing services and uh, you know, a world order that historically has been dominated by the big networks. And uh, in our view, there's arguably more disruption now than at any time in the last decade. So I was interested to see um, uh, if my panel could share their views on that and if, uh, if they agree some of the causes of that disruption. I thought perhaps, Christoph, we might start with you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, so just in general, um, since I might just have the most outlying perspective, um, my personal feeling really is um, that the reference point to the business is actually changing. Um, so I, I've been quoted on media um, on that quite often. Um, the way I look at um, the development and transformation of digital business is uh, more a value creation perspective, not a digital marketing perspective. So we consider ourselves not being experts in digital marketing, but see digital marketing as a consequence of definition of digital business. Um, so um, my personal feeling is a um, tech is getting more complex. So the buckets um, and uh, the buckets of speciality are getting bigger and more interesting. Um, around AI, um, around um, supply chain management, around B2B technology, that that on one hand side is a driving factor. Um, and you see a healthy polarization um, in the buying centers. Um, I feel that all and everything, including content, by the way, um, is being commoditized um, on the buying center of marketing, whereas the buying center of strategic consulting um, that now becomes a digital uh, strategic consulting is still in good shape and allows for healthy profits. So what you're seeing is basically um, that client development, if you look into the Deloitte's and the Accenture's of this world, um, is deriving from the top. So you see top-down approaches from the strategic consulting into the marketing realm. 
Um, so that new forces that have superior profitability um, uh, in uh, client um, uh, situations are entering the market um, and just fill in marketing as additive um, and bringing up the customer lifetime value of former, uh, former uh, strategic consultant clients. Um, and that is really shaking up the market. So we did a benchmark just in order to kind of determine our um, strategy. Um, and if you compare an agency and a consultancy that work for the same client, um, you see that um, the consultancy files for 1.8 times the day rates um, on the same client, uh, which is causing quite some superiority on acquisitions, um, on the way forward and stuff like that. So in general, my perspective is um, if you understand yourself to be in the marketing realm alone, you might just lose um, the battle of consultancies and agencies fighting against each other. That's a, that's a very nice start to a big topic because I, I, uh, uh, I mean, we, we are um, hearing a lot in market about uh, the coming together of data, media, tech, content strategy all in one place and the breakdown of siloed services. We'll come back to your point on technology, which yeah, I, I sure. think is definitely another key trend. Perhaps um, uh, Ulrika might get your perspective on that. I mean, he, You've got a group uh, which covers all, all the bases on an international scale. Um, how do you sort of cope with that disruption as, uh, as a group from all of those disciplines trying to bring them together? Yes, yeah, so Denso is not the typical creative lead agency holding, which we are seeing um, decreasing with also the death of the brand Grey. Um, and I always, when I discuss with people from agency holding networks, which are creatively led, it always seems that the party is over. They all think of the good old times. And I think also when, when, I, when I have visited Cannes, um, there you see how the good old times in the creative industry have been. Um, so this time is over. Talking about Dentsu, we never were really, really big in the creative field, which um, you could see as a problem. But I think it's a really, really big um, it's a big asset currently and also today. Um, we are an agency holding group really focusing on data and we acquired Merkel in 2016, which was, um, it was the biggest disruption for the agency. And um, Denso is itself, it's a kind of buy and build organization. More than 50% of my people in DACH come from acquisitions. More, from, more, more than 50% of um, our leadership conference attendees also come from acquisition. So we live from this entrepreneurial digital spirit coming by, the, um, by acquisition. And I think we are not the typical agency holding being disrupted by, by any consultancy because we are pitching at the clients for the same accounts, um, digital led, um, highly, highly automating um, service-led mod business models, and that's because we are really, really strong also in the Mar MarTech business and combining it with the media business. So there are different types of agency holding, holding networks. I, I, I would say the creative ones and the more digital ones. Got it, got it. And uh, I mean, that's a nice um, thread actually for me to bring Christian in on, because clearly, Christian, you, you, you've got a, a, a group with uh, some exceptional brands, but multiple brands um, within it. But you are uh, uh, not just a digital first group, but it's effectively a digital only group. How, how do you, um, what's your perspective on the, on the disruption? Where do you see PIA in that? Um, I think um, we live in an attention economy, actually. So I think it's fully true that uh, content so uh, designing ideas and delivering the right content is certainly something which is very necessary. It's all about distributing or planning and distributing the, the content towards the proliferation of channels, which we have seen in your presentation as well. And I think everybody would agree that that's the data part or the tech part is essential because it becomes all a little bit more fragmented so um, at the end, it's an N, N equals one uh, situation which you have. So basically, I think this is truly correct. And that's why we have um, designed the group in a fashion we did it, uh, strongly believing that the traditional or the legacy agencies are not able to really include 
technology correctly and properly. So I think it's the other way around. I think it's far easier to add marketing know-how to the tech uh, services than the other way around. And that's a little bit the principle of PIA. So we come very much from the e-commerce, from the, uh, the tech perspective, having own proprietary technology as well as being able to, to adapt, let's say, in a way. And we add these kind of um, additional uh, points to our group. And um, so I, th I, I, I think it's not the disruption you said at the beginning is very much true, but it comes that new players evolved over the past decade. And they are all driven by technology's perspective. And, and this is not the core of the legacy old big international networks because they come very much from the creative as, as uh, Ulrike just said. And we are a little, a little bit the other way around. And I think it's far easier. Um, uh, what I think is the most dangerous actually to the big networks is the transparency issue of the media. So that is basically they are all built on the media buying, let's say, profit bucket. And that's a hugely high exposure over, over the next years. So okay. that will shift the market dramatically. And that's a good reason why the consultancies at the moment are not entering into media yet. Because it's a model which is not really compliant, is it? Uh, uh, perhaps we might be interested to put that one back, back to you, Uwe. Clearly, we follow this thread. I mean, media is a massive part of um, Dentsu's business, and we come, come in with the Dentsu Aegis uh, heritage. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how do you? How are you guys coping without and driving innovation? Um, you know, tech-led innovation in, into the media uh, world, yeah. countering yeah. the uh, uh, so, historical sort of you know lack of transparency in the in the media yeah. world. Um, so first, we are of course hundred percent compliant. It's in all of our um, client contracts. Um, really, really clear. Um, and when I joined Dentsu, um, everybody said media is dead. And I also thought perhaps I have five years to transform um, the region um, in, in order to really um, build up new services and fully digitize the media business. Um, but, but in my eyes, and being more than three years now in the group, media is not dead at all. Um, and media is digitized and is in a transformation and still really, really relevant. And when I talk about media, I'm also talking about performance marketing, online marketing. That's part of our media business. And we are number one with our prospect with more than 300 people doing e-commerce, media buying, media planning, and um, with the digitization, we are also growing. And um, regarding our margin, um, it's still really good. It is under pressure, but it's still stable. So I didn't believe that when I joined. And I would say media has really, really good life um, in, in Germany um, the next for the next 10 years, and then we see what happens. But um, at least the media business lives longer than I thought when I joined two years ago, and um, lives also longer than the whole industry is um, is talking. And when I, for example, talking in media with TV buying, that's just a, that will not be in-housed by by the clients, and it will always be in the agencies, and um, it will be digitized, of course. That's also the reason why we bought Video Beat, which is a, a small performance-based. TV agency startup two years ago. They are our disruptor. Um, so, and at we, uh, as we have battled for the same clients, I thought um, I'd rather buy them um, because I, I didn't want to fight them. And we see it. it's, it's just growing side by side with the tradi traditional media business. I've, so, I've... I, see a, I see really a long life for the media business. And on the other side, half of my staff is Martech. And combining those two, customer-centric disciplines, which are both data-led, highly automized. I yeah. think that's a, it's just a great combination. So 60% of our revenues are digital. I'm quite satisfied with that. Yeah, yeah no, and I, I, um, I say we, we see media as a big growth area because we, where we see um, innovation and also um, I think proprietary tech-driven capabilities I mean, perhaps I might use that as a segue to turn to, um, if we go back to point Christoph made right at the beginning about the second key part of disruption being technology. I mean, we see the mantra uh, repeatedly now with big and small agencies talking about uh, how to cope with this disruption for clients 
where, you know, we've got to deliver the old agency model better, faster, cheaper. Uh, and uh, I was interested on, I mean, to the extent where we, we were selling a big company uh, and both buyer and seller turned over the first pages of their decks and, the, and it had written there, better, faster, cheaper. That was both of their missions. We got that deal done, by the way. Uh, but uh, you know, it strikes me that the um, technology is, is a key part of sort of changing the game for how things are done to deliver things better, faster, cheaper. What's, um, uh, perhaps Christian, go back to you on that one. What's your perspective on, uh, on, uh, on the role of technology within agencies? That was a Christian, not a Christoph, right? That was a Christian, yeah. <laughs> we can go to you, Christoph. <laughs> Sorry, to me. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. for you, yeah. <laughs> Would you would you jump first in, uh, Christoph, or do you want me to answer that? I, I could happily jump in here um, and just come in um, with the gold rush um, and ask the question whether you want to uh, dig for gold or sell the shovels. Um, so um, my my core belief is proprietary software is that, um, and I would not sell that, and that has been true since the late nineties. Um, uh, and whoever did that build proprietary software to find themselves in a situation where this wasn't a sustainable business model. Um, so agencies, um, from my perspective, are the wrong space for proprietary software. Um, there, there may be some kind of interim situations where this is an interesting um, business model, but this is not sustainable. Um, I think that understanding the main ecosystems, which seem to be the sales forces, um, Adobe's, Hybris's, uh, Strikers, whatever of this world, being uh, capable consulting on that and implementing on that um, is the role of the agencies. Um, and that, um, by, by the way, because everyone claimed that our revenue is 100% digital, um, uh, uh, the, building that capability, building the assessment competency um, on consulting on the right tech stack and integration of the right tech stack and in the housing of the operation of the right tech stack um, for me is where agencies will carve out value um, and that clearly is a competitive realm to the consultancies that we've been talking about so um, really getting boardroom access and the assessment competency and not diminishing your role by trying to sell proprietary software which is not the sustainable business model for me is what agencies should be doing um, and i feel that there still is a slight trend in the market of developing on your own, which is just not the right way. You can develop parts of ecosystems, Salesforce or whatever, um, and kind of blend that in an IP-based consulting way, um, but you're not going to reinvent the Salesforce um, as a preparatory solution. Now, again, I, where we've seen, um, and I'll come back to you now, Christian, but I guess where we've seen technology within independent agencies that we saw be particularly effective is where it's filling the gaps between existing technologies uh, so, uh, you know, and usually quite bespoke solutions uh, that just don't exist in markets. So it's developing so quickly, that, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's got to always evolve. I mean, perhaps, Christian, uh, you, know, you know, the role of technology as, as an enabler, what, what, what's your view on? I, I, I agree to Christoph, but would, would like to add two things. One is um, it depends. Uh, I mean, there are agencies and coincidentally, we have three of them who own proprietary um, uh, technology who we sell as a product and that's quite different um, uh, and I, I think um, it makes a difference whether you start now or you have already something in your hand which you can sell as a product but I would in total agree that um, and that's our way as well we think um, we should more be the company who is able to operate, to integrate, to build adaptions to existing standard technologies because there is no way that a small company like us is able to cover up with R&D resources of Google or Facebook or whatever. And uh, I mean, we are already uh, at the size of about 1,100 people in, in Germany and uh, have a, quite a, a few development resources, but I think that's a huge bet on something which takes a while and you can never ever be able to cover up. So the, the role of agencies in our industry going forward is to my mind, not developing software and sell them as a product, but rather be able to adopt and to build customer journeys and so on, um, link the things together to, to, uh, to build a perfect match for the client and that's I think the room 
for us and the niche where we can uh, develop ourselves. Um, uh, that's the way we see it, basically. Oh, got it. Uh, and what about your week within in Dentsu? Perhaps we can talk about how you drive in yeah. a bit. Well so I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more, and I have a personal experience in um, in my time at the Ed Pepper Group where I had to sell all the EdTech business because we were just not able to cope with the with the competitors um, in in money and in development, and and therefore I would never ever again um, invest in own technology. We we perceive ourselves as neutral service providers to our clients, and um, and that's the reason, and and that's. In a martech business and also in a performance marketing, online marketing business. So we need to be neutral and um, select from existing technologies from the market and um, consult our clients um, for the best technology solution. And there are so many, it's so our industry is so fast and so complex. And the tech development is also so so complex and so fast that we would never be able to cope with own technology development. And there is another thing, um, I think the own company culture. So when I look at the company culture at Densu, we are marketing service providers. We are MarTech people. We are some creatives, influencer marketing people, um, media people. We are not tech, uh, we have no tech culture. So I think we would not be the right home and also not the right decision makers for any tech related um, decision. Um, nevertheless, and I think when we talk about technology, I think it's important to see that technology can also be a platform. And when I think of the latest BMW pitch, it was quite big in Europe, covering 26 countries, and we were also part of this. They have, um, this pitch um, was a request for a marketing platform. And a platform is something implementing existing technologies in some piece of tech. So I, I, would, I would be, I'm a fan of um, tech platforms, which is a piece of tech for integration existing big technologies out of the, of the market. Which is very much your realm as, uh, as well, isn't it, Christoph? I mean, what, what's the, um, perhaps picking up on that theme uh, of tech platforms or and then technology generally, what, what's um, some of the, the most exciting things you're seeing out there driving opportunities for, uh, for, for you guys and, and people involved in the digital transformation advisory space? Uh, now, this is kind of the, it's nerd time, um, uh, and, and for broader context, um, uh, I run a family. <laughs> Let's go semi-nerdy, not too deep. Um, so, um, so the way we look at that, and I look at that, and this, this is really something that is TLG on one hand side, my family holding, where I act as a software investor on the other hand side, um, uh, that, that is how I cope. So I, I see that as kind of a portfolio um, of things that I do, um, and Bonchan and No Daughters, which is my family holding, um, is invested in business process mining, um, in HR and recruitment software, um, in um, production virtualization software. Um, and, and that informs business decisions in our consulting. So um, uh, really having a proper software investment vehicle helps me understand um, the signals on uh, what is the software that our clients need when it comes down to in factory, when it comes down to supply chain automation, when it comes down to um, logistics and internal logistics and stuff like that. Um, and, and this really is kind of a different understanding of a digital business consultancy that we are, um, that has an agency attached to that. Um, we need to be capable consulting on all stacks of software, not only on the customer interface, um, because I feel that a lot of businesses at some point will turn into B2B2C businesses. Um, so logistics software is at some point going to influence the way customers interact with brands and stuff like that. Um, so we go, and I personally go, um, uh, that full circle when it comes down to software. And my biggest bet when it comes down to um, European software is clearly business process mining. Um, so automized process analytics, um, that is going to change all and everything. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, uh, and uh, I mean, there I ask, I mean, we, we released a report <laughs> on um, Sorry. the impact of it. No, that's, that's, it's a good topic. I'm going to move on to one other sort of key tech buzzword without going too nerdy on it. But we we released a report last year on the impact of AI on marketing, uh, a, a much overused and overhyped term, I know. But um, uh, it, it, does that uh, loom large in in uh, uh, your thinking? Perhaps put that question to you, Christian. Is is that something you're starting to see come through in in the work you're doing for clients, or is it still very early? 
No, I think that's very early, actually. I think um, uh, I can't see really the big, uh, the big business case coming very soon. And also what I, what I get from clients is that they think about how do we depersonalize, let's say, the uh, or personalize a depersonalized client coming from the automation. So I don't think that, I mean, talking about chatbots and all these kind of uh, new offerings, I don't see really a major shift coming in the next couple of years because yes, in specific areas may be, but it will not be a big blast, I think. And what about um, the development of, uh, uh, I mean, obviously AI and the development of AI depends on having vast amounts of data and the feedback loops between them. Uh, I mean, a hugely topical point right now, I, I guess in the marketing world is, is um, the you know the foretold death of the cookie um and, and allied to that you know obviously there's an endless debate about uh you know privacy alongside that do we um where do we see the, the data well for marketing going a week i know that's a terribly uh big question but give us a bit of insight from your perspective i i would just like to answer on the ai because i think it's a very interesting and important topic um also in marketing and the way i see it is um, when I joined Dentsu, I saw um, a lot of manual processes and I was really shocked because I came from a digital, um, digital group and there's a lot of Excel files and emails back and forth. And as I have not a lot of patience, I thought um, before I do a process optimization project, let's put AI on it and everything is fixed. It didn't work um, like that, but um, we have implemented um, an AI project together with um, Arago. It's, that's a, um, an AI company in Germany, quite well known. And it's running really, really well. We use it internally. Um, we didn't market yet. So it's, I think it's the first time I'll talk about that. Uh, we, we have really closely monitored the results and the AI is sometimes even better than ourselves in doing decisions, planning decisions, buying decisions. It's kind of a meta engine which you built, and I think AI can really, really help in all industries, not only in my industry, but in all industries to um, automate, automize and make internal um, processes much more efficient and faster. So we don't offer that clients yet, but I think if it's, it's, a good, it's a good case. We can offer it probably also for clients, but then more for internal process optimization and it not using it directly in the marketing. But it's, it's, it's early, but it's coming. It's, 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 it's running um, and it's, it's, it's really fast running. So it was a kind of a plug and play solution um, Arago has built. And um, it's, it's really, it's fascinating to see how it works and as um, when it beats the human being Great. in decision making. Yeah, got it, thank you. I mean, moving, uh, moving on from AI for a minute, let's, let's, let's skip the privacy question for a second. It's a big topic, that one. We'll go deep on that if we, if we go down the privacy arena. Um, perhaps I could put a more open qu uh, question to you. And um, if, if you wanted to pick out, perhaps, Christian, we start with you, we pick out one trend you're very excited at the moment about that's going to drive um, growth and value in your business, you know, in the, uh, you know, from the industry, what would that be? Did you ask me? Let, well, let, let's, start, let's start with you, Ulrika, yeah? Ask. Yeah, let's, let's go, go for it, Ulrika, if you, if you uh, have one. Uh, just top, top, top trend you see at the moment in your industry, it doesn't, doesn't have to be the top, but the top, one of the top three trends you think driving value creation from here. Yeah, so in my perspective, and uh, it's, a little, it's a little narrow perspective, of course, it's the MarTech business, it's the technology um, business which is in the end, the digitization. And um, especially during COVID, when you feel that the marketing budgets might be cut from one day to another, but your MarTech business is growing and delivering the highest revenue and um, profit since, uh, since, the, since the founding, um, then you see where the industry is going. So I think MarTech business implementation of marketing technologies um, around the customer journey 
that's really it's a big trend we are in the middle of this trend yeah got it so so um uh, you know a lot of the work that um, you're now doing with for example namix as part of the stable absolutely namix which is yesterday we announced that we have merged namix with blue infinity both companies are in the matic field um under the brand of merkel so so now we have the brand merkel in the dach region and um it's it's just growing this business and yeah. we are in all kind of industries and we don't talk about marketing anymore when we go to a client we don't talk to the cmo with martech business we talk to the cdo cio ceo managing director um, shareholder so that's also interesting how that topic affects another level in another um, department in a client yeah got it in fact i mean that that's a, a a really interesting trend we've seen drive a lot of uh, m a actually particularly if i go for uh you know from the perspective of the consultants for example who we've all seen enter the industry the you know the consultants traditionally were addressing the cio or the cto but not the cmo yeah. the marketing agencies you know the opposite yeah. um, uh, and when we sold karma armor to accenture it was specifically to help them address storytelling to be able to talk better to the cmo and then send yeah. it with other services yes i mean it, it, perhaps we could talk talk about that dynamic for a second because um on a on the competitive landscape uh, more broadly uh, where do you guys see the uh, you know the key competitive dynamic is it between consultancies and agencies uh, or you know considering you're now firmly competing against each other in, in, in that realm as, as you've pointed out uh, or, or is um, uh, as big a dynamic the competition from digital pure play challenges like Christian's group or like Martin's Sol's new group uh, how do we see that now today? Perhaps, Christoph, why don't you kick us off on that? So overall, um, it really depends on the business line. Since we have a consultancy business line, um, it is the mechanisms and procedures of this world. So the softwareization of all businesses across our core verticals, which are um, mobility, banking, finance, and health, um, our core competition is the mechanisms and procedures of this world. Um, on, on the agency side, um, the interesting situation is we're not competing against traditionalists because this is not the backup that, that we got called for. Um, what we're seeing is um, that there is a consolidation. So back in the days, what you saw is that there was a vast number of specialists being um, uh, called for RFIs and RFPs. Um, that has clearly consolidated around um, certain groups that are perceived as clearly digital groups. Um, so there, there is a consolidation in that kind of digital first lead agency realm already that we would consider ourselves being playing in. Um, so on one hand side, um, uh, agencies basically dropped out of the consultancy. We don't see them anymore. Um, we, we, we feel that there even is a way back from uh, the Accenture's and Deloitte's into the most traditional top management consultancies. Um, so you have seen Deloitte and Accenture more in top management pitches. You see them less now. Um, and on the other hand side, the specialist is basically gone. Um, you see integrated digital groups, um, or you see none at all. So it's become a, it's become more of a, a game of scale you have to have. This and, and, and I think we're, we're entering a market where that whole talking about digital um, uh, more and more becomes the bullshit it is. Um, uh, we now talk about our agency branch as the uh, digital first lead agency. Uh, we could just cut that away. We're a lead agency. Um, so uh, I, I think for, for me, digital has never been the defining factor. Um, it's basically people want to buy organic apples, so we're going to give them organic apples. Um, but but it, what you see is that digital native digital agency groups will soon be the lead agency groups and that will see those incumbents um, uh, not being capable um, uh, getting rid of their legacy. Um, and, and that is accelerating to 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 massive degree. Yeah, I, think, I, mean, I mean, I think that's a massive trend we see as well. I mean, uh, some of the groups we, digital groups we put into um, uh, big players and, and we take, take the combination you mentioned earlier, Rika, the combination of Gray and AKQA with AKQA taking over that brand. You saw the same thing with um, YMVR and uh, Young and Rubicund. Uh, we've sort of seen the same thing within Group M when we put Essence into there, when we sold that business in it, 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 it now pretty much lead the whole of Group M, the CEO of Essence is the CEO of Group M. Um, how, do, uh, 
how do you, how do you see that, Christian? With um, uh, you know, as a digital pure pure player, how, how do you um, you know, drive you know that competitive advantage? Uh, you know, without that you know legacy, perhaps. I mean, you you are a pure play digital agency, not just digital first. How how does that play out in in your business with clients? I would say. Um... Firstly, um, I can't see really the big consultancies competing with us in actual, uh, let's say, pitches or even on existing clients. I mean, from time to time, you see them implementing big tech stack or something like that on a very international scale, which is obviously not what we are currently doing. So, and I have serious doubts that the recent M&A activities from consultancies buying into creative agency will really pay off after a longer period of time because it's a strong cultural clash, um, which is not easy to manage. And I'm very much looking forward whether really Color Rebel will succeed inside Accenture or not. Um, what we see nevertheless is a strong, and we have a lot of conversations at the moment, I see two very strong things at the moment. So there is a a little bit of a um, disappointment about using so many suppliers for managing your whole account. So I see a consolidation actually. Um, so people are, are getting a little bit tired of uh, coordinating so much suppliers delivering uh, their marketing uh, budgets. So there's, I think, a consolidation which will be a trend towards us to my mind. Uh, and secondly, I would agree to Christoph that um, it has been always a discussion of a brand leading authority or something. And I think the lead agency, this was a perspective which was reserved to the legacy uh, agencies. And I think that changes at the moment because brands and their interactions, I mean, brand building is determined differently than a couple of years ago, um, as we all know. And that's that's the playground of the, the digital players. So I would agree, cut off this, this, um, uh, uh, this leading role or the predefinition of who's, who's in charge of that. And um, the third is that I think we have a strong, we as digital agencies, we have a strong home turf in really operationalization of, of software and and uh, and managing the platforms and I think that's beneficiary because the world is let's say going on platforms at the moment so that's why I yes we have this typical I mean I think the, the competition is more amongst the big international networks still in specific topics so we find ourselves yes we find ourselves in a pitch against uh, Havas or, or, or the, the media groups um, on specific issues, let's say. But um, it's more like, the I think the competition is among the ranking we see at the moment in Germany or on a broader scale than Europe or, or, or internationally and with the marketing services group. Not so much with the, with the um, uh, consultancy business maybe a little more on, on system integration actually yeah 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 and that makes sense i mean uh, as christoph said do a business line and i guess ulrika you're, you're you're very firmly in in, in both as a group and um uh, on the sort of martech implementation and, and uh uh but also media and marketing oh. and creative what, what's totally. the totally you uh, to totally so what, 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 <laughs> yeah so, so i have a, we have a lot of competitors uh, depending on the kind of service um, which is required i don't see a real trend i thought about what kind of trend in the in the market or among the clients could i see and of course there is a trend of integration um, having all services in one hand having 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 a customized agency set up um, but I need to say, I, mean, I need to admit, since the BMW pitch um, has been decided, um, I don't talk about um, full service agency or lead agency anymore. And I even think scale is not everything because um, the decision was uh, given to a, a setup of three different agencies. And I call that full service by design. Um, and that means, and I'm also playing this, um, this game 
um, you know, we, we don't have a creative, a big creative agency in my region. So, but I have integrated client. And I think what is very important, um, you need to be um, able to scale and also to deliver all kinds of services your client wants from you if you are in a leading role or the integrator. And we just partnered in kind of a strategic alliance with a creative agency to serve our integrated clients. And we have also solution teams who are working on the client and integrating all kinds of services. Could be internal services, but could also external um, external service providers, um, which are kind of strategic partners. So for me, it's a more a loose future because the market is so so, so fast developing and um, also the disciplines are more and more fragmented. Um, and I will never be able to have everything under my roof. I would like to, but I will never, never be able. I can't buy all kinds of services and agencies. So I think this, this kind of full service by design as kind of integrated customized agency is, is the future probably. So, so, so a lot, it sounds like a lot of that is about just being able to operate in a very agile way in terms of yes. putting yeah. services for clients. And, and being able to collaborate, not thinking in silos, because in the end, it's a people's business and it's a mindset. You need to be able to, to work together with, um, with, with agencies outside your own uh, network or with, with people with different skills. That, that that point about agility and speed, you know, we, we hear a lot, obviously, in, you know, because what we do is tech, but we hear it a lot in the digital agency world now as, as a key factor. Uh, and uh, I mean, one one thing I wanted to ask about um, is, you know, one of those areas of where you need agility and speed is in innovation. I mean, I, I sort of believe that everyone can innovate, but it's easier to move it quickly uh in smaller organizations how what, what's um that puts christoph you see a lot of this what's what's your perspective on that and uh you know having been in in, in uh you know an independent small organization now as part of a huge group we are a small organization and we're still rather independent so um i i truly believe in two factors factor number a agencies needs, need to be um, industry specific so um, we're verticalized around industries because you have to have an understanding on where industries are going um and that that, that is kind of the firm factor um, of an agency um and the kind of agility and speed comes from um we call that micro enterprises um, so uh, fully fledged teams that consider themselves as a fully enabled micro enterprise, um, even below entity level, um, that that can be plucked into um, uh, the, the the verticals that we're operating in. So th this is really kind of the organizational approach that we take into that um, uh, pillars being hard on verticals um, and soft on the um, micro enterprises that we put in place that can change in capabilities um, and in staffing. Um, so this is how we roll, um, and I feel that agencies at some point, agencies are whatever service providers, uh, you could all, even call them uh, consultancies, um, will come to a point where playing a portfolio game um, of a freely combinable portfolio um, of those micro enterprises, as we call them, um, will be key to um, servicing the clients right. Um, so. Um, massive combination of possible um, uh, portfolio elements um, in certain situations. That is how I feel uh, clients are serviced best. So it's sort of a, a, enabling a culture of collaboration and multiple entrepreneurial communities within a big firm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an atomized design of an organization um, that we're finding um, having the smallest possible entity being really small um, uh, and in, 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 the, in the smallest case, a team of five people or such um, to then be able to freely combine them. Um, and since we um, are running on a weekly sprint with the whole company, um, changing direction and combination of those micro enterprises is possible on a weekly basis. Got it. It's all about the people, isn't it? I, I guess I'm conscious of time. I, I want to, so I'll move these to the last two questions quite quickly, if I, if I would, if I could. Um, you know, uh, clearly this is our church is, is m &A, right? And apply to your sector. Uh, but it seems to me it's played a, a, a major role, not in just the uh, formation of many of today's tech unicorns, but also uh, most of the big players in marketing services today. Quick, uh, quick 
poll amongst the three of you, if you would. I mean, how important do you think the role of M&A today is in your sector? That's Christian, we start with you. I think um, M&A is, um, is ongoing very important because um, the, the problem with building it up on your own is uh, the classical issue of chicken and egg. So if you have no references, you get no clients and the other way around. So I think what gives you more access to, let's say, sea level and uh, to have something in place which is already there and which has proven success and a decent client base. And also what we are all looking for, I think, is to, to uh, add more talent to, to the group. So it's, it is just the quicker way on, on, on uh, let's say, covering up with the market necessity. So I think this will not change. Um, what I, and you see it already, if you look in the ranking, I mean, the table of the top 10 or top 20 is dominated by financial backup. So, and, and this is a trend which will go on um, because simple private owned companies haven't thought, have not the resources to, to do so. So I think this will not at all change. And as, we, as it becomes more complex, um, you need to get a decent view on the market and add companies while you want to grow your business. Let's say if you want to become a dominant player in whatever, let's say market landscape you are, I think there's no way around of, of doing a, a selected M&A, let's say. Thank you. And very quickly, as I, I think we're now at uh, four o'clock. Ulrika? And, and is, perhaps, um, you know, literally one, one sentence answer, because I have to draw it to close, yeah. but I love the answer. So there is not much to say. Then so is build on M&A. M&A, if you can afford it, is key for your development. Either you divest in order to get um, enough cash to develop what you want to develop or to um, to simplify existing structure or you buy a disruptor you buy a new culture you buy a new skills and um, being part of a big corporation 66,000 people um, very complex structures we would never invent what we have bought so it's the only way to transform perfect Christoph being part of Omnicom's M&A based roadmap to change, um, it wouldn't be really honest to um, speak against that. Um, I feel that incumbent organizations in whatever organization, uh, in whatever industry, always have to apply M&A in order to um, accelerate for change um, in an ever changing environment. Perfect. Johan, just... Johan Wolfgang Goethe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to know I'm going to stay in a job. So uh, I, 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 I am. Um... I'm going to draw things to a close there because we, 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 we're now um, five o'clock in German time, four o'clock here in the UK. But uh, I wanted to thank um, all three of you very much for your insights and contributions today. It's a, a, there's a huge amount to play for, I think, still to go in this sector with a lot of growth and innovation to come and surely more M&A. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Great panel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.